Where have you guys been? Where have you been? Oh, I see. Yeah. I know that. Good morning, everybody. I know we didn't have the countdown music this morning, so uh, I just love the conversation. I always really hate to be the guy that interrupts that because it's such a blessing to hear from up here. And uh, I just want to say thank you for joining us at West Lafayette Christian Church. And uh, thank you to everybody from home who's joining us as well. And to all you mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. And uh, we just, I, wanna, I want you to know how much uh, we appreciate you and how you truly are a gift from the Lord. Uh, before we start today, we've got a couple of announcements, and I wanted to share. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure if I was to give you three guesses of where where I'm going to read scripture from, you would probably come up with it on the first try. But I chose this specific section of Proverbs 31 um, because Proverbs 31 not only is a a salute to the godly woman, but also as a personification of wisdom. And I think that uh, they are one and the same. And so I'm going to start at verse 25. <clears throat> Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Amen. What would we do without our mothers? And for those of you who uh, this is a solemn time, if, if your mother's not with you, then we're going to pray for you as well. 
and uh, and we're going to pray for many blessings upon us all today as we celebrate our precious mothers. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just give you praise for this day. Lord, we thank you so much for the seasons of life. And today we give you praise for spring as it may be finally upon us. Uh, but God, it, it just there's so much color and life and beauty. And Father, we give you thanks for that because it all comes from you. And these are the gifts that you give us. Let us not take them for granted as we worship you today, God. Father, we thank you for the blessing of motherhood and the challenges that it brings. And God, we thank you that you are faithful, that you never leave nor forsake, that your word is true, your promises are always fulfilled. And we just ask you to be with our mothers today, Lord, <clears throat> as we celebrate them. And we ask you, God, to be with those who are remembering their mothers in their absence. And uh, Father, we just pray for your blessings upon us all today as we just gather around your word and seek you. Father, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I asked Paul if I should mention this, and uh, he said I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, it was on my heart as I was reading this proverb this morning. You know, sometimes us men, we, we loathe that silent treatment, right? But let me tell you something that was on my heart. And on her tongue is the law of kindness. She opens her mouth with wisdom. Guys, when you're loathing that silent treatment, try to think about the alternative. Maybe it's in wisdom that they keep from opening their mouths. <laughs> and maybe we could learn something from that. So let's remember that today. We got a couple of announcements. Next week at the nine o'clock hour will be our annual meeting, and anybody's welcome. Don't if you don't con think you're a member here, you're still welcome to come to that annual meeting. And there's a budget summary out on the counter in the in the lobby if you want to pick that up. And if anybody wants a more detailed breakdown of the budget, you're welcome to visit with Mark Sonatel on that. He'll be glad to. He's hand up right back here, so he'll be glad to uh, provide that to you if you want a more detailed account of that. But please, um, this is our church, and we look forward to seeing you next week at 9 o'clock. Um, we just want to give a quick Summer Sunshine update. We are one week into registration and already 81 campers and eight counselors, so that's really exciting. And, yeah. Let anybody else know um, to come. Join us. It's a great week. And then for volunteers, we have a few that um, are volunteering. You can go on our church website, and um, it'll show you a link where you can link to the planning center, and then you just click on volunteer, and it has every different option that you can volunteer. We still need lots of volunteers for every afternoon. We still need someone to be a coordinator for the um, – for the Wednesday Monumental Day, um, and I'm willing to pair up with somebody to do that um, if you don't want to do it on your own. Cookies, volunteering for cookies for Friday night's um, reception. All right, thanks. All right, let's rise and worship the Lord today. We're going to praise him for his grace and his mercy, because it's greater than our sin. Amen? <clears throat> praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He comes not there, so.
years of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy. said his mercies are new every day. Often in my prayers, I try to remember to thank God for the times where we're not aware of his mercy, the times where we don't know that we've strayed from him or wandered from him. And every time he's faithful, amen? That's what I love about this song, because no matter how many times he has to bail us out, as David remembered the faithfulness of the Lord, we too can trust that he will do it again and again and again because he loves us. Yeah. 
still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never failed me yet you've never I never will forget You never failed me yet I never will forget Amen Praise God for those promises, amen We can believe that we can believe those promises because victory has already been won because Christ gave all so that we could believe and receive those promises. If there was anything we could do, then he did what he did for no reason. So if you don't know Christ as your Lord here or at home, know that he has paid the price. He paid every last penny. And you too were wonderfully and fearfully made. And he wants to know you. Jesus paid it all, every last cent. Let's praise him for that. Whoa.
Morning. So my name is Eliseo. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I think I see some new faces. Uh, I am the youth minister here at our church and also one of the elders. John Dimmer is the one that usually preaches, and so he's out of town this week uh, to Colorado. So he asked me to cover for him. Um, some of you that know me well, they know that I'm from a small country in Central America called El Salvador. Yep. And El Salvador has many beautiful places. The people are generally friendly and nice too. But as you know, there's no country on earth that is perfect. And so El Salvador has a bad word. The ugly side of El Salvador is its gang problems. And these gangs are so evil that they essentially charge a living tax, or rent, as they call it. If you're a business owner, they extort you, and they threaten to kill you and your family unless you pay them 
a fee that they get to determine, and it's usually a high amount. My dad, being a business owner, he was lucky himself to not be bothered by them for many, many years, until a few years ago. And think about that for a moment. If you were a business owner, and the gang starts sending you handwritten letters with death threats and signed by the chief member, what will you do? They certainly know a lot about you and your children, the time you go to work, where you leave, where your children go to school, the types of vehicle you drive, etc. And these gangs, they run an intelligence surveillance network where they have multiple people posting at key areas where they can track you and your family. And they're very good at communicating and sharing information with one another. And they're very sneaky as well. So what do you think my dad did? Like many other people, he paid the rent. No, that's not true. He didn't pay the rent. He did the exact opposite. He fought them back, and he didn't do this by physical means. He fought them on his knees with prayer and fasting. And he wasn't the only one, of course. He had hundreds of people join him in this spiritual battle. And my dad was, he understood clearly that this was a work of the devil to bring fear and doubts, to remove his trust from God and give in to the threats and deceptions of the enemy. Now, I don't blame people that have paid the rent to the gangs. I would also be concerned for my life, and especially for my, my wife and son. I wouldn't want anything bad to happen to them. So, but the thing is, we cannot be moved by fear, especially from those that can harm us or those that wish evil on us. There's no human being ever that can touch us unless God allows it. So would you open your Bibles to chapter 10 in Matthew, verse 26. Matthew 10, verse 26 says, So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. So what is Jesus talking about here? And we know it's Jesus because it's in red letters, right? <laughs> but really, who is Jesus talking about? And we know this by its context. We look at the beginning of the chapter and, and see a few verses before that Jesus is talking to his disciples. Look at verse 24 now. The student is not above the teacher, nor servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So Jesus here is talking about those that oppose the disciples and anyone else who seeks to do harms to the followers of Jesus. Jesus says, if they even call me devil, or I'm the leader, why do you imagine they will call you and do to you to my followers? Now, that's a paraphrase, of course, but that's essentially what Jesus is trying to communicate. Jesus was called Beelzebub, or Beelzebul, depending on your translation, who in the Old Testament was a Philistine god, lord of flies. But for the Jews, Beelzebul was another name to refer to Satan or devil. But some of them said, by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. What a terrible thing to say to Jesus, to call him prince of demons, when in fact he's the prince of peace and lord of lords. So Jesus faced opposition, a lot of it. He was called offensive names, ridicule, hated, and even murdered. 
If we, who are followers of Jesus, are doing what God wants us to do, we will face opposition. It's expected. And maybe you already have faced some sort of opposition because of your faith. If not, is it because people don't know about your faith? I once heard a story from a preacher talking about someone else that told him, Pastor, I've kept the testimony of Jesus clean and good. I curse and use profanity at work, but they don't know I'm a believer. And the pastor jokingly referred to them as members of the secret service, you know, because you're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be fake so that they don't find out who you really are. But the point here is that you, we are to be authentic, open, and genuine about our faith. Look at verse 27. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. So nothing is to be hidden. Jesus' teachings are are supposed to be obvious, clear in our lives, in our speech and actions. Our lives are supposed to be a mere reflection of what Jesus was all about. And we can't be part of the secret service. We have to be bold about our faith, open and honest about it. And when I was going through my officer school with the Army a few years ago, there was a classmate that asked a question to another classmate, what is your religion? And he answered back saying, publicly or privately? And for a moment when I heard that, I was confused. But that right there told me he was not authentic. He had two different lives, and depending on the situation, of course. And ironically, this was a person who wanted to become a politician one day. (laughs) But let's keep your finger on, on this page and turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, Show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. So though many, no one here wants to become a politician, at least that I know, in some ways we have become like public figures, open to criticism and ridicule, which is why even we have to be careful about our words and the things that we do. The world is looking at us intently, waiting for us to make a mistake or say something that could be misinterpreted. Have you ever met someone who twists the words of people and phrases to make someone else look bad? That's also what the world does to us. Think about when was the last time you watched a movie or TV show that wasn't Christian, but that made reference to Christianity in a positive way? Probably a long time ago, right? (laughs) So regardless of how others may treat us, what if they mock us or offend us because of our beliefs, Jesus calls us to be bold, so much so that even we had to be willing to get on a rooftop and share the gospel. And by the way, that's why we need volunteers to get on top of our picnic shelter so we can replace it, right, and get people up there to start preaching. But, you know, if there's any volunteers, for sure, talk to Gordon, and he'll tell you more about that. Now, whether Jesus meant a little rooftop or not, I think we can all get his point that he's trying to convey to his disciples. Remember in chapter 5 of Matthew, 
Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A, built, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that many see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, here in the U.S., we're lucky enough to have freedom of religion. We're allowed to open, openly worship as Christians. But in other countries, they're not. China, North Korea, are just a few examples where they have banned and made Christianity illegal, and it imprisons preachers and Bible teachers. The Islamic State of ISIS persecutes and kills Christians unless they renounce to their faith. How hard it is to be a Christian in those countries. And yet sometimes we feel ashamed or afraid of publicly speaking about Christianity here in the U.S. How crazy is that? Do you remember the story that I told you in the beginning? My dad, like many others in a tough situation like that, was threatened to be killed by true gangsters. And I'm not saying he never had any fear or any concern for the messages, but he was more confident and reassured that he had a powerful super weapon to fight back with, with prayer. And at that moment, he chose to fear the one who can kill both soul and body. Look at verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. If you ever were in a situation when you have to choose to fear God or some other powerful entity, never hesitate to choose to fear God above anything else. What did Daniel's three friends do when they were ordered to worship the pagan god by the king of Babylon? What were they afraid of? Burning in a fiery furnace? The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter than usual as those three Hebrew men refused to worship the image of the king. And he says that the furnace was so blazing hot that even if its flames reached the, the king's soldiers, they burned alive and died. So why do we fear so much what others will think when we are so bold about our faith? Why are we not using every single opportunity to spread the good news of the gospel? Is it because we have, we're more concerned about not offending people? Or maybe we don't want to be called religious fanatics or radicals or whatever the case may be. Look at verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Even the birds of the sky are taken care of by God. If a bird doesn't fall to the ground unless God allows it, it will not happen. And the same is true for us. How much more important are we than birds? We are God's children made into his image, and he will care for us every waking moment of our lives. We will only face opposition or experience hate or receive death threats because of our faith only if God allows it. Remember in the Old Testament in the book of Job, he says that God gave permission to Satan to mess with everything he had except his own life. 
And this doesn't mean that everything bad that happens is a direct product of God's will, but that he simply allows evil to exist for a time, evildoers to be, just for a time, for a greater purpose. And at that moment, we cannot comprehend what God is doing, the things that are happening when we are in the midst of those trials. Who here has gone through a difficult time and in that particular moment had a difficulty seeing God's goodness and mercy? I know I have. And looking back, it's easy. But when I was experiencing those hard moments of my life, I I had a hard time seeing God's goodness and mercy. But all of those things have served for my own spiritual growth and my own spiritual training. And that is if we allow God to use those low moments and difficult times of our lives, he will surely use it for good in the end. Everything is in his control. He knows it all. He knows all the hairs of our head and he has counted them all. And although for me the numbers are going down as I'm, <laughs> so I'm starting to lose hair the older I get. And I once had long hair, as you see. <laughs> I used to have curls too. You know, it's fun times. But you see, we, we need not fear those who can physically harm us. Instead, we ought to fear God himself. Scripture says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I used to wonder what this fear was or why we were told to fear God. But when I was preparing for this sermon, I thought more about fearing God and its meaning. And I remember my experience back in the military. And I know that I give a lot of military analogies, but just bear with me. So when I went to recruit training a few years ago, the drill instructors, they wanted to instill fear in us on all the recruits. They purposely made it scary so that we would be afraid of them. And why, you might think? Because it's a powerful tool to make others do what you want them to do. And maybe you think of other examples where people use fear as a persuasion tool. But at least in recruit training, the trainees needed to be able to move fast and without hesitations of the order, at the orders of the drill instructors. But what happened after a time when all the initial shock was done? That fear was no longer fear. We later learned the limitations of the drill instructors and the sergeants. That fear became faithfulness. In other words, that fear had turned into commitment to the training to one another in the mentorship dynamic that we had developed with our superiors. After a time, we came to understand that the sergeants were hard on us because they wanted to bring out the best of us, the best version of us that we could be for the armed forces. I think the same is true in the Christian life. If one person obeys God out of fear for hell or his power, then that's better than fearing that the fear of being ridiculed or publicly ashamed or even death. Stephen, in the book of Acts, was asked to shut up and to stop preaching about Jesus, but he chose to fear God instead and not those that could kill him. After our time, the more we grow, that fear of God becomes faithfulness. And that doesn't mean we disregard his power or authority over all creation. We come to appreciate the hard times and the moments because God allows it for our own character growth and to strengthen our faith and trust in him. Verse 32. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. 
If you have already acknowledged Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I rejoice with you. But if you have not acknowledged him as such, for whatever reason, today is the day that you can do so. For whoever doesn't acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, that person will not be acknowledged by Jesus before the Father. There will come a day of judgment, and you will be judged primarily by your faith, not your actions. And if you put your trust in Jesus alone, you will be saved. I once went on a local evangelistic exercise with a group of believers, and we went to a local park and talked to people about Jesus and Christianity. And we encountered this one individual who gave me and my partner a whole list of reasons why he was displeased with God. And we asked him if he wanted to reconcile and make things with God, to make things right with, with God. But he started going and going, giving us a whole list of complaints. And I was much younger at the time. I was a teenager, actually. And I kept making him expressions. He's thinking on my, my partner, Just all sorts of different hints. You know, like, hey, we got to go. We got to wrap it up. It's taking too long. And probably after 30 minutes or so, nonstop, listening to this man's complaints, I suddenly interjected and simply asked him, but the question is, when, when would you reconcile with God? And he looks at me and says, later. Not in his head as if he was agreeing to something or knew something for sure, but he didn't choose to reconcile himself at the time with God then. Now, I don't know what you're going through, anyone here in this room or watching online. I don't know what struggles you're experiencing right now, but please don't be like that one man. A later time may not come. Life is like a mist or a fog. It stirs for a moment, but it suddenly disappears. We simply don't know when we're going to die, and naturally we can't predict exact time and date of our death. So if you had only one more chance to redeem yourself before God, would you take it? At this time, we're going to take the Lord's Supper, a sacred time to remember what Jesus has done in our lives. All those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ are welcome to take it. Normally, when we take communion, we often think of our personal lives and spiritual journey. But today, I also want to challenge you to consider those who have not come to the faith. Pray for one to two individuals who you know who are not believers. And maybe it could be the someone, you, it could be someone that you care about. Maybe you have often tried talking to them about Jesus or Christianity, and you have often been rejected or shut down. Pray for those people just once more. And also thank God for what he's doing in this congregation, in this church, because without him, we would all be lost and hopeless in this world. May God bless you and your family this week, and... May you enjoy a happy Mother's Day. Thank you.
Hebrews 12, chapter 2, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Why would the Hebrews writer be encouraged to say that? Other than the fact that we are going to experience discouragement. We're going to experience resistance. And if we're not experiencing resistance, the question is, are we truly being ambassadors for Jesus? Because the world is not always kind to us who do act as ambassadors, any more so than they were to the Lord himself. So as we go from here today, let us look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, because he went before us in all things, not just good things, right? So as we gather with families, as we go about our lives, let's ask God for the power and for the wisdom to be witnesses. I have this little prayer that I say all the time, and it's because I'm weak and because I'm young in my faith, but I grow every day. But I have this little prayer, not my thoughts, Jesus, but yours. Because I kick and scream like a baby when things don't go my way. Now, you may not see that, but that's what happens inside of my heart. And I think if we're going to be honest, that's what we all do. That's why we love our mothers so much, because they put up with that, right? So let that be our prayer. Lord, your thoughts. Fill me with your thoughts so that I can have your eyes, so that I can see those, like LSAO said, who need to hear about your word and to see your truth in action, right? So let's, let's rise. Let's go ahead and wrap this up today. Let's turn our eyes upon Jesus. Let's get to the right song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory.
come from you. Father, you are our strength, our shield, our joy, our peace. Let us not just receive that to ourselves, Lord, but let us be a channel for that to flow through us. God, give us your heart. Give us your eyes. Give us your spirit so that we can discern. Go with us as we go today. And Father, we thank you that you are not far away, that you hear these prayers, that you, God, live in us in jars of clay. Let your light shine through the cracks. Father, you are good, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week.